One of these is from Mondi, Mondi domes and trays to get your cutting started. Orange looks like this. Yeah. So this is Mondi on this particular card or tips and tricks for cuttings. Because statistically, if you grow a healthy plant, it'll root. So it's the magic to getting a cutting to root, grow a healthy plant. So I keep hearing, you know, people get like uh, almost no success, like their whole crop wipes out, um, all the cuttings in the tray die. And then there's those guys who get 98% and nothing ever drops. There's only one difference between them, and that is the health of the donor plant. The healthier the donor plant, the healthier the cutting is going to be. There is no magic. It's not Clonex gel. That's not going to be the secret. Even if you have a sick, dying plant, you can add Clonex gel or great white microbes to it, any of those things. But the reality is the plant will still die. If you've got a plant that you've been feeding too much nitrogen and the tip's bent over and falling, you won't be able to fix it by taking a cutting and growing another plant. Cuttings have to be healthy. A healthy cutting will root into your hand if you can hold it for five days. They do it all by themselves. A tree gets struck by lightning, the branch falls, the individual branches turn up, they reach out and root into the ground and continue surviving. Yeah. So <clears throat> there isn't too much to taking a cutting beyond growing a healthy plant. So until they root, if you have a healthy plant and you put them under a dome, um, you'll end up with uh, 24 hours of T5 light, very low light. Cuttings don't have roots, so they can't grow. If you try to grow a cutting, it'll die because there are no roots to uptake nutrients. And uh, they quit checking on them. There really isn't too much for you to do, right? They need 10 days, two weeks. So you water them once, and then you leave them the fuck alone until they root. Anything more than that, and you're just getting in their own way. As far as humidity, you don't need much under the dome. All you're trying to accomplish is that the plant leaf doesn't transpire and drip water because with no roots at the tip, she can't dynamically absorb water from the media so she dehydrates and dies. On the back, if everything's going well, there's some tips and tricks. You can split your cutting. You can shave the outside a little bit if they're, if they're kind of woodsy. Um, when you put them <coughs> into the root riot from Clonex, you can, the starter plugs, you can see that they should be fit in there snug. If the tip breaks, throw the cutting away. If it rattles around in the hole, that's never good. If you push it out of the bottom, that doesn't work either because now the cutting tip's exposed to air and that's just not going to happen. If you have a turbo clone machine though, a cutting can dynamically absorb water in a hydro system like a turbo cloner. So you put your cutting through the closed foam cell um, neoprene insert and what hangs in the bottom gets wet from the sprayers. The tip can dynamically absorb water from a hydro thing like from a hydro cloner like turbo clone. If you're in a very dry environment you may want to add a dome. Here in Houston you don't need to add a dome. Mm -hmm. Especially in the last couple weeks. But you put a cutting in here and then this is a turbo cloner. They got nice little inserts for your fingers to take them out. That's always a big deal when they get bigger. You try to pull them out and they're wedged in there and you end up tearing the cutting. It's not too complicated, it's just got a little spray feature. One of the things is in all hydro cloners, the pump sits in the water that it pumps. So all the heat that the pump generates goes into the water that the pump sits in. So Turbo Clone has a vent that'll take out the humidity and some of the heat. I also suggest adding a timer with a 15 on, 15 off schedule. If the pump's only on half the time, you only produce half the heat. If it's still a problem, you can always add like a frozen water bottle. A lot of people do that. You can also put it on a cool countertop to make sure it wicks away as much heat as possible. Turbo clone. It grows, the thing about these things is it grows roots two inches up all the way around. The big thing that you're looking for in a cutting is the amount of roots that you can get. So roots are the lungs of the plant. The thing about, when you look here, uh, not on this one, on one of the other ones, they talk about the 45 degree cut at the bottom because you get more surface area. But the reality is that's just like one side of a six sided die. If you cut the bottom off, that side one. So the roots start at the edges of the 45 degree angle and they come down. And just like we saw in, the, in that room, you end up with a couple of roots that come down and then they bush out. You're looking for lots of roots that come off the plant. So the trick about turbo cloner is you end up with roots two inches up the shaft and all the way around. That's not just the one side of the die. That's you know four more sides. That's 400% increase. So you're looking for more roots because roots are fruits. 
You can get the same results from any of the starter plugs from Clonex or the Root Rides. You can get the same results, but you just wait an extra couple of weeks. Uh, this turbo cloner speeds the process up and it forms the root buds quicker and then you get the actual roots that come down. But the two inches up all the way around is like one of those things I can't express to you how valuable it is. And then you can take it out of here and go in hydro or media or cocoa or soil, wherever you want to go, it's pretty versatile. But the roots are always the thing. And this is a cloth pot, cloth, cloth pot. like here's one from Smart Pot. The neat thing about a cloth pot is it gets air through the material, so when the root runs up against it, the root tip dies. Smart pot. You end up with a dead root tip, and when the root tip dies, all those individual hairs become roots of their own. And that's what you're looking for. It's a sudden and exponential growth increase in roots. Uh, you cut the one off, you pinch the one, and all the side root hairs become roots on their own. They run into the edge of the pot, those root tips die, and then all those root hairs become roots. And suddenly, you go from one of those plants in their display room that has a couple of dangles and a big bunch to a big bunch attached to the roots, to the stem itself. And that's what you're looking for. It's, it's a less precarious situation. It's greater redundancy and a much bigger surface area. More root, more fruit. And that's like the name of the game, right? Flowers are just the advertising. So it's all about roots. All right. Okay. Rotation's a big deal. A one light rotation, a two light rotation, a three light rotation, you have to ask yourself what you're trying to accomplish. If you've got a one light rotation, you're gonna grow a plant for 30 days, you're gonna flower it for 60 days, and you're only gonna get a harvest every 90 days. But that may be enough for you. If a harvest every 90 days works, that, that's great. You get yourself a 600 watt or a 1000 watt light, depending on how much you want to yield, and you go from there. But when you're done flowering, you didn't grow anything to replace it with. So the harvest is kind of over and you have to start over again. Whereas in a two light rotation, it's a little different. You're always growing something and you're always flowering something. So as soon as your harvest comes down, you have more plants and veg that you can put under the flower light. The bonus is, if you have a 600 watt flower, you have a 400 watt veg, you're still at a thousand lights, but only for a couple thousand watts, but only for a couple of hours a day while both lights are on. A two light rotation is, for the most part, the most efficient. You can get more, but you lose a little bit of the efficiency, and this is now a three light rotation, where you have one light in veg, two lights in flower, and a 30 day stagger. You still get the same yield as this rotation, if you have the same light, but you get it every 30 days. You could do both lights at the same time, both flower lights, but then all of your product comes in at the same time, and sometimes you don't want that much product on the market all at once, you want to stagger it 30 days apart. So you stagger the lights. You have one veg and two flowers. You'll start this garden in January, you'll start this garden in February. When this garden comes down in March, you'll start it again. When this garden comes down in April, you'll start it again just by taking the plants out of veg. So there's this math that comes with rotations of how often you get how much. I talk about light schedules, and you were saying that you used to grow 24 hours in veg or 18 on, 6 off? Uh, 18 on, 6 off. Okay, 18 on, 6 off is the way to go because plants do stuff in their sleep. Um, they convert light into sugar all day. But in their sleep, they take the sugar from the leaves and transport it down to the roots. So if you go in, if you got 24 hours of light in veg and you go into flower, the transition time increases because the plant has to grow more roots. The sign of a root problem when you go into flower is about three weeks into flower, the plant yellows from the bottom up and dies. She can't support the root. And usually you get that from either 24 hours of veg and you just don't have enough root, or you are overwatering rotted the root hairs, the plant can't absorb the nutrients, and as she doubles into flower, she yellows from the bottom up and dies. So if somebody comes into my store, and they're like, I'm in week two or three flower, everything's kind of yellowing up from the bottom. Uh, uh, you know, I have some news I have to tell you, sir. I'm afraid to inform you that your plants are gonna be dead within a week. And there's no way to recover from it because you don't have any roots, and now you're deep into flower. So the root part and the scheduling is pretty good. Cuttings like this get 24 hours of light. They're not trying to grow. You're just waiting for them. There's no roots for them to produce. You're just waiting for them to produce those roots so you can start them on an 18 on six off 
veg cycle. Then 12-12 for flower, and that's what triggers the cycle. But that 24-hour veg is something that I run into a lot of times, and it impacts your flower sec. It impacts your flower results. So I try to get you guys to veg with uh, an, on an 18-6 schedule, so you don't have as much time transitioning into flower, um, and it works pretty. It works much better that way. It's just a math game. I have a question. You yes. were talking about cuttings earlier. Um, I had a, I had about four mom plants for about five years that, that I cut off of. Is there a certain like time limit for that, or just okay. as long as they're healthy, they're good, right? Every cell on a plant is pretty much a stem cell. You can root a leaf. It can't grow anywhere without a growth shoot. But any cell on a plant can be converted into any other cell. And you think about it, humans have been passing their genes down for, what, 10, 20,000 years. And we've gotten better. And the same thing with plants. You can take a cutting from a cutting from a cutting from a cutting, from a cutting ad infinitum. The plant's not going to change into, you know, you're not going to get an orange tree from an apple. And as long as you've grown a healthy plant, usually what happens is it outgrows the space. And then you just replace her with one of her cuttings. Yeah. Oh, so you can cut, take a cutting of a cutting of a cutting of a cutting. And Forever. It's not like, it's not like uh, I mean, what are we talking about? It's like digital, not analog. Yes, not, <laughs> right, not analog. <laughs> not you don't analog. lose something with each copy. That's right, because genetically, it's genetic. Wow. Otherwise, there would come that. this point yeah. where, what, was, you, what would happen? You get a mutant plant? And what, would, what would be the sign yeah, of not sense. being able to take a cutting from a cutting? So you would have to, what happens? Does it hermaphrodite? Does it grow nodes this far apart or this close together? Does it? So there aren't any signs and symptoms. Really, if you take two plants and you make a seed and you grow another plant, essentially, it's a copy of the previous plants. If you just take the same plant, it's just the same cells going on. If you have a plant that flowers automatically and you take cuttings from her, an autoflower, the cutting will flower. The cutting is on the same time as an autoflower. But on an indeterminate, when it flowers based on a season or something like that, um, it, it just, or a trigger like 12-12, the plants, the veg plants are always the same. And a cutting from a cutting from a cutting, as long as you want. Usually, uh, you'll see like in the hydroponic stores, they'll grow tomatoes plant, and they get big. And then the sticks, the stalks get real thick, and then they get real sharp, and they get dangerous. And that's when you end up replacing them, <laughs> when they outgrow the light. But there's no time limit on a cutting. There's no loss in potency. There's no alterations. <clears throat> if you took uh, 24 cuttings and you grew them all in the plants, and there was a problem with one of the cuttings, you would see it in that plant. And you would not take a cutting from that plant, or you would perpetuate the problem. So if you're going to replace a mother with another plant, just replace it with a healthy plant. And you know that plant looks and acts just like this plant. I hear it all the time. But the reality is the guys who say that aren't growers because the guys who are growing are growing and they just don't give a fuck. And they just take their cuttings, they replace their mothers. They maybe you'll get a new strain and learn something new. But you never run out of a cutting from a cutting from a cutting. It just genetically it doesn't work like that. It would express itself, you would be able to see it, and you just wouldn't replace the mother with that one plant. You've heard that, right? Take cuttings from cuttings is a problem. Oh, the the genetic thing and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Nonsense. Hogwash. It's cloning. That's all we're talking about. The genetics that are in that plant are in that branch, and every cell in a plant's the same cell. So you can't. Kind of no getting around it. <laughs> yeah. There's, yeah. There's just no getting around it. And there's so much myth and hype and taboo right. because so many people fail in indoor gardens, yeah. and they all have their reasons why they fail. pH lockout doesn't exist. PH lockout, you mentioned it, but pH lockout doesn't exist. pH lockout describes a condition where you've rotted the root hairs. So if you have a root on a plant, you have the hairs at the bottom. The hairs absorb nutrients, the shaft absorbs water. Together they regulate how much salt the plant uptakes. If you try to drink ocean water, you know, a couple of gallons of ocean water, you'll be dead by tonight. You try to drink four gallons of tap water, you'll be dead by tonight. We're talking about a salt balance inside the plant and outside the plant, an osmotic pressure, like an RO machine, but the opposite of, you know, you have to match the salt inside the plant and outside the plant. All the nutrients you see here are salt. You know what I mean? Mother plant, A and B, all salt. I always ask you guys, if a plant's yellow, what does it want? If the plant yellows, you know. If yellows, it wants nitrogen. Nitrogen. But you didn't say can of nitrogen. You didn't say botanic air nitrogen, GH nitrogen, fox farm nitrogen, mother plant nitrogen, um, advanced nitrogen. It's nitrogen. You said nitrogen. 
That's what the plant wants. If it's purple, she wants mad. If the leaf tip pulls to one side, she wants calcium. And so she wants what she wants, but there's no name attached to it. If you look at the periodic table of elements, it's nitrogen, man. Now that said, if you're good and you're getting what you're supposed to time after time after time, and you switch nutrients, you might find a nutrient that works better for what you're doing, absolutely. But in terms of the average grower and the average yield, it doesn't matter which nitrogen you give it from which manufacturer, because N is N. Um, you can run into a problem, some stuff has like N2, and if you get too much nitrogen, you'll see that your tips get soft and they fall over. And if you try to take a cutting from that, you, it continues to fall over uh, over the next 24 hours when you separate it from the plant. So, you know, that's why they say woodsy cuttings are kind of good. But in terms of what the plant wants, it's nitrogen. So all these nutrients this work. Is Cal in fact, in my store, it's the number one selling bottle in my store because CalMag is the number one problem in a healthy garden. If your plants are growing fast, magnesium converts light into sugar and gets used up in the process. Think of it like fuel, think of magnesium like fuel for your car. You don't just get to fill up your car once. You continue to have to fill up your car as you use up the energy. So magnesium is the central molecule in a chlorophyll ion. Start to finish, the plant wants mag. Up until about the fourth week of flower, she'll want calcium and then she'll want sulfur after that. But the plant wants mag, and it works like this. Mag is a 200. If you add two to pure blend, which is a 235, essentially you get a 435. A 435 is a grow nutrient, more nitrogen, or something close to a nutrient. You could add more of this and get a 535, a 63735, whatever it is. You can continue to add nitrogen to a flower nutrient, and now you have a grow nutrient because there's more nitrogen than PK. Essentially, that's what makes a grow nutrient, that's what separates a flower nutrient from a grow nutrient. Ah. So here's a grow diamond, and this is in the books that I give you guys. The top half is grow, the bottom half is flower. What differentiates the two? A big N on top and big PK at the bottom. Because fruiting flowers want PK. That's what they build their flowers and roots from. Growing plants want N. That's why aquaponic works with some plants and not others. Because there's a lot of N in aquaponics. So you want leafy plants, not fruiting plants. So here in this grow diamond, you can see veg is all about the N. Flower is about the PK. If you continue to add N to PK, until you have more N than PK, you get a grow nutrient. So these things are interchangeable. Does it say flower? Yes. Can you make it a grow nutrient? Yes. Can you take a grow nutrient and make a flower nutrient out of it? Yes. Add PK. Add PK till it's higher than the N. The important thing to know about magnesium though, and this is where we started with this, the important thing to know about magnesium, um, I tell you guys there's only five problems in our world. Too much light, too much water, too many nutrients bugs, and when everything is going good, not enough magnesium, which shows as purple stems, purple petioles, the leaf tips will cuff up, the whole leaf will fold to try to reduce its exposure to the sun because it can't convert light into sugar because you run out of mag. So you'll get a plant that's light green that's growing quick and it'll turn dark green and dark green um, as you give it the same mag and as she gets bigger. You can tell problems by holding a leaf up to the light you can see if you have a spider mite bite, if you've got a uh, yellowing of a leaf, there's a lot of things that are obvious when you hold a leaf and try to look at it through the light. So you want mag the whole way because mag is the central molecule in the chlorophyll ion. You only want calcium, like CalMag, like this, until the flowers are full size. And then you'll switch to mag sulfur, which is the sweet product because that's got more sulfur, and sulfur is the ripening agent. That's why people add molasses. It has sugar and sulfur in it as a preservative. So this is the mag thing, but realistically, there's only a couple of problems that growers run into, and the number one problem in a healthy garden is not enough mag, because you're converting light into sugar at a faster rate, and you run out of mag. Um, I show you guys how to measure PPM, like literally, you can figure it out week by week if we answer a couple of questions. So yield's based on light. 
It's not based on nutrients. If it was based on nutrients, you wouldn't buy the most expensive, hottest thing in your garden that you have to pay to cool. If you could do this and grow with just nutrients, why would you ever buy a light? So once we start with the photosynthesis equation, it works like this. Using light for energy, plants take water and CO2 and combine it into sugar and oxygen. That's what plants do. Nowhere in that equation do nutrients exist. It's just not how it works. You go to a gym to get buff, and you merely eat the amount of food to support that level of exercise. So nutrients are the calories that support exercise. Exercise is the light. If you have a 400 watt light, you'll get eight flowers every 60 days. If you have a 600 watt light, you can expect 16 flowers every 60 days. And if you have a 1000 watt light, you can expect 24 flowers. A 1000 gets you three times what a 400 will get you. A 600 gets you twice what a 400 will get you. And there's a mathematical curve that follows that, and it says that the 600 watt light is the most efficient light that you can grow with. It's 50% more electricity than a 400 watt, but you get twice the yield from it. A thousand isn't the same thing. If you double a 600, if you go from six to a thousand, it's 75%, 66% more light and uh, more electricity and only 50% more light. But once you turn on a light, most people turn on a thousand because once you're doing it, you might as well get as much as you're gonna get. So you tend to grow under thousands, but if you're just growing for yourself, a 600 watt's fine. What I like to talk about is, when I talk about light, is how much space it takes to absorb a certain amount of light. If you have a 400 watt light, you're gonna grow in a space about this table. You'll have a four foot eight bulb T5 that'll grow over a two by four space about two feet deep. Two by four is eight square feet, two feet deep is 16 cubic feet. So a 400 watt light requires about 16 cubic feet worth of plant material, the canopy not the stalks, not how high your plant is, just the leaves that absorb light. It takes about 16 cubic feet for a 400 watt light. <clears throat> a 600 watt light is twice as bright, so you need twice the area, which is a four by four space, two feet deep. And a thousand watts, three times a 400. So you need like a five by five space, two feet deep, which is 50 cubic feet. That's what it takes to absorb all the light from a thousand watt bulb. If we know then that plants double during flower, then we know that plants need twice the light in flower as well. So if you veg with a 400, you flower with a 600. If you veg with a 600, you flower with a 1,000. If you try to do the thing where you veg with a 400 and you flower with a 1,000 and your plant doubles, by the end of flower, you'll have 800 watts worth of plant. At the end of flower, you'll still be throwing 200 watts at the floor, which means halfway through flower, you are throwing 500 watts at the floor. You know, and at the start of flower, okay, so you just keep throwing light at the floor. The object is to get a huge amount of plants, like 600 watts worth of plant, like four by four, two feet deep, under a thousand watt light. And over the next eight weeks as it doubles, it'll double into a five by five space, two feet deep. And you've used up all of the light. But notice nowhere in here have I told you anything about nutrients. That's because in the photosynthesis equation, there are no nutrients. Light for energy, CO2 and water equals sugar and oxygen. That's the end of the equation. Nowhere in there do nutrients exist. So when people go, oh, how much am I going to get? How do I get more? How do I, bop, bop, bop. What we're talking about is how to either efficient the light, make sure that all the light's being converted into sugar, and that's determined by the health of the plant and grower talent. The next component is, do you add more light? Because if you double your nutrients, you'll kill your crop. The correct amount of nutrients is the correct amount of nutrients, and anything more or less than that amount negatively affects taste and quality. So we're looking for the correct amount of nutrients. And let's say you know the exact correct amount of nutrients, and let's say you double your light and you double your space. Would you double your nutrients? No, you'd use the same nutrients in the next space, because nutrients don't have anything to do with yield. Nutrients have to do with the health of growing of the plant. You are not going to grow a faster plant by giving them more nutrients. That's like you drinking seawater thinking you're going to be healthier. It doesn't work like that. What it does work, though, is the two limiting things in the photosynthesis equation are light and CO2. So we start off with how much light you have. You get X from a 400, 2X from a 600, 3X from a 1,000. Then a light mover, something like this. Here's a light mover. Light goes back and forth. When you use a light mover like this, you can see that the light comes, eventually it makes it over here and then it goes away. 
What's nice about a light mover is you can put the light a foot closer to the plants and get a foot more penetration without overheating the plants because you take the hot spot off the plant and you move it down the way. So rather than doing a five by five, you might do a four by six or a four by eight and run the light down to the end, put it closer. And by the time the plant heats up to a dangerous level, the light's already gone so you never get there. They talk about how much light is lost from the top, from the bottom of the light to the top of the canopy. And there's two different ways to think about this. Think about the light like a street light. A street light casts a very wide arc, but you get less and less light as it goes. But an LED, like a little handheld LED, you can shine on a building a block away and still see the dot. Where an HPS or a gas light has this spread like this, an LED doesn't have that kind of spread you can see where it gets bright right there. Well, it's coming back, bah, it's moving. All right. So here's the edge of the light. You can see if I move further away, the angle looks something like this. If you've got a four by four space, well, this is a 550 <coughs> watt next light. It has all the spectrum of an LED plus all the spectrum of an HPS in one. It's 550 watts and it works like a thousand. LEDs have a little bit of magic because LEDs because LEDs have more penetration than an HPS light. With HPS, you tend to strip the inside of a plant and the flowers end up on the outside because you don't have the penetration. But with an LED, you have spectacular penetration. Together they work very well. But you can't put a 1,000 watt HPS and a 1,000 watt LED together unless you have 2,000 watts worth of plant. The problem that you run into is if you run a scrog like this and you put an LED over it, it doesn't light up the whole canopy unless you put on a light mover. So with an, L with an LED, right, I mean, with an LED, you can put the light further away. Just like you can shine an LED on a building down the block and still see that red dot because the light is collimated. Think about a flashlight hard over. You can go see as far as that flashlight can go, you turn it the other way and it goes wide, but you can't see as far. So if you have a very big hood, it's like having a wide flashlight. It doesn't penetrate as far. So you end up with, th here's the difference between a wide hood and an LED. If you have very tall plants, the light's only gonna get to the, the HPS light's only gonna get to the top of it. But if you have LEDs, they're gonna be all the way down to the floor because it has more penetration. So you have this combination of two different ways to use the light. Your job is to figure out how to use it for your garden. You okay, want yeah. water? Okay, that you gotta, it's your job to figure out how to use it. So if you have a very wide canopy and you're using an LED, of course you're not gonna get what you're supposed to get because you're not using it right. That would be like trying to drive your car with a couple of flashlights on the hood you don't have enough light to break to see far enough. So if you try to put an LED over a wide crop, you're gonna lose it. But then if you try to put an HPS with a supersized hood over tall plants, you're gonna lose it. So people say, ah, LED. But they don't say that about HPS because they've kind of worked out the details of HPS. <laughs> but LEDs are spectacular. This is a next light. It has all the light, all the spectrum of an LED plus all the spectrum of an HPS and you move it back and forth, and they work really well. They also work really, really well as a supplement, as a supplement to HPS light. So if you've got a 1,000 watt HPS light, with instead of stripping the middles out of the plant, without increasing your plant count, and just by adding light, you can get more yield from the same amount of plants. I tell people if you've got a 1,000 watt overhead, get a 200 watt supplemental. If you've got a couple of 1,000 watts, you may want multiple 200s or a 400 kind of beaming across the whole crop. There really is a difference in flower production between an LED and an HPS. You can really see the difference in quality. Together, they work spectacular, but you have to use it in the right way because if you do this, you're gonna get less than you're supposed to, and then I'm either gonna get a customer that thinks, oh man, HPS sucks, or a customer that thinks, oh man, LED sucks. But when you tape a couple flashlights to the hood of your car and you run into a wall because you couldn't see it coming, of course you're gonna blame it on the car's headlights and you're gonna hate that car. 
But the reality was the grower wasn't using it right. There isn't any problem in the store, including the one where you hung your lights from fish wire and it falls on your plants <laughs> and breaks your hood and the bulb and the plant. It's all grower fault. Everything in this store works. Somebody hates everything in this store because they failed with it. But the reality is they probably water their plants in this display thing with broken jugs when they come in. We drop a jug, the lid cracks and it starts to spill. Up, oh, pick it up. It goes in the grow room because if a plant's yellow, it needs N. If a plant's purple, it needs mag. If it has tip twist, like drawstring, it needs calcium. These are simple things that plants need, and the answers are pretty simple. Usually it's because when a plant needs something, it's kind of one of a couple of things. You put the light too close. When I talk about putting the light too close, this is what I'm talking about. A hood requires a certain spread. You saw with the LED as I moved my hand in that there was an angle of the light. You have to make it such that the spread covers the whole area. So if you've got a 600 watt light, the spread has to be out over the 4x4 four four area. The next thing to consider is a plant cannot grow with 101% light. Let's say you have the absolute perfect garden, whatever the fuck that is because it doesn't exist. You have the perfect whatever. If you give the plant 101% in a perfect garden, you've got too much light for the rest of the equation. You have too much light for the photosynthesis equation. Your plant stops growing. It bleaches. It whitens. The leaves, the flowers, it can't. These are usually like in the middle of the garden right underneath the lights. You can't get 101% light in plant growth. So if you put your plant up against 100%, she has nowhere to go. So not only do you have to pay attention to the spread to make sure it's getting to the edge of your crop, you have to make sure that the plant is still another foot or two away from that or she can't grow. So quite frequently you'll get people that come in with the cutting and their 1000 watt light is over the plant like this. Not only is that plant incapable of growing anywhere, you're never going to get anything out of it no matter how many nutrients you feed it. So what I try to show you guys is matching the hood to the shape of your garden. If you've got big plants, you're going to need a focused hood with more penetration. If you've got a wide garden like a scrog, you're going to need a bigger hood with greater width and less penetration. Because if you try to put a focused hood over a wide garden, you're not going to get what you're supposed to get. <clears throat> now, not once yet have I told you how to grow. And I have no intention of telling you how to grow because it's irrelevant to me, all this stuff works. What I try to get you guys to understand is the relationship between light, yield, how much plants you have, and the health of your garden. In the photosynthesis equation, CO2 and water equals sugar and oxygen. Nowhere in this equation do nutrients exist, so if you double your nutrients, it does not affect the math equation. Plants are autotrophs. They take their energy from the sun, they don't break down nutrients, they don't have to eat anything like we do. Nutrients are merely the salt that balances the plant with its environment. Too much salt on the outside, the plant will dehydrate to try to balance the salt on the inside. And you'll get miniaturization and a smaller plant four weeks from now than you started with. While everyone's plants just keep growing, yours just keeps shrinking. The same. So in this first thing we talk about total light, that's light plus a light mover plus CO2 because in the photosynthesis equation, that's all that's on the one side. So yield, the results, is based on the input. The more inputs we have, the faster the reaction, the greater the carbon she can store. Plants are carbon fixers. She takes the C out of the CO2, she releases the O, she keeps the H from the water and some of the O's, and she makes sugar from that equation. Um, you can see the equation, Here's the photosynthesis equation. Um, using light for energy, she takes C and O. She makes, she makes sugar, C6H12O6, and releases O2. So the O2 is her byproduct, that's her waste. She also transpires to sweat also. So the amount of sugar she can produce is based on pretty much two things, light and CO2. So your yield is based on how fast you can convert light into sugar and oxygen. That's the end of this equation. Nutrients merely are the salt that enable her to keep turgor, the correct amount of salt inside the plant with matching salt outside the plant. Same thing. So yield is based on light. So we start with how much light do you have. Let's say you have a thousand watt bulb and a light mover. You essentially have 1250 watts. If a thousand watt light requires a five by five space two feet deep, 
1,250 requats requires more. And if you add CO2, suddenly your 50 cubic feet is like 75 cubic feet. That's a 1,000 watt light on a light rail and a 4x8, just 1,000 watt with CO2 on a light rail. That'll fill up a whole 4x8 tent. You figure 1,000 watts is 5x5, five five, 2 feet deep, that's 50 cubic feet. A 4x8 tent is 32 cubic feet. 2 feet deep is 64 cubic feet in a 4x8 tent. So 50 watts times 25%, you end up with 62 and a half cubic feet, so you're right on the track. So pretty much a light rail and a 1,000 watt light, perfect for a 4x8 tent. You'll get a little more penetration, you can go almost 3 feet. So now you've got 4x8 times 3, 32 times 3, you've got 90 cubic feet. Um, a light rail and CO2 is 50% more, so you have 1,500 watts. You'd require 75 cubic feet to fully express that light and get what you were supposed to. But it's easily doable. You go from 24 flowers to 36 if you had a light rail CO2 and everything is, I'll show you, if everything is healthy. So there are different problems your plant can have. You can have bug problems, leaf problems, light problems, root problems. There are all sorts of problems. The more problems you have, the less you get. The next one down is life cycle. If you know you've got a four week veg and an eight week flower, that's a 12 week life cycle. You're gonna finish the last couple weeks. If you're in hydro, you finish for two weeks. So basically you have a 10 week life cycle. That's what you're shooting for. Four plus eight is 12, minus the two weeks it takes to finish in hydro. And then finally, how much plant material you have. Because if you've got a four by four space two feet deep with a thousand watt light over it, you can't get what you're supposed to get because a thousand watt light requires a five by five space two feet deep. So you are not going to get, you are not going to fully express a thousand watt light. The equations come into play here. If you want to know how many nutrients you need for any week, what week, what's the life cycle of the plant? The life cycle in this case is 10. 4 plus 8 minus 2, the life cycle is 10. Let's just say we have a 1,000 watt light. We know 1,000 divided by 10 is 100. And then we said we were in week 5. So 100 times 5 is 500 ppm. So somewhere in week 5, you should be at about 500 ppm. So if this is our track with a 4 week veg and an 8 week flower, if this is finished, then right about here, we should have peak plant material and we should have peak ppm. So if this is a thousand here, then we know we can't be giving that plant a thousand. If you give the little plant a thousand, right, you have to have enough plant material to support it. So without telling you which nutrient or how to grow or any of these things, all I try to put into perspective is you don't feed a small plant like a big one. Because if you fed a small plant like a big one, by the time you had a big plant, what are you gonna feed it? More than it's supposed to get? The correct amount of nutrients is the correct amount of nutrients, and anything more or less than that is only going to negatively affect the final product. So, there is no exact number. Like I said, when you're good, different nutrients will produce a different result. But 500 ppm at about week five, just coming off veg into flower, that's pretty good for media. If you're in hydro, you might have a little more, a little less, but it's a pretty good starting point. Ppm should never exceed light. So if you have a thousand watt light, plus a light rail, plus CO2, the max PPM you'll hit here is about 1500 because you have about 1500 watts worth of light. But there's the scale. So you don't give a plant that's this size this much light. This is like a little 50 watt plant. You would need, this is a little 50 watt plant. If you had a thousand watt light over it, you would need 20 of these things to absorb all the light. 20 of them means that you can't put the light here or 12 of them won't be under the light. 20 of them means that you have to continue to raise the light until all of them are lit with penetration such that the bottom leaves don't suffer. That's the name of this game, converting that light, absorbing it by the green of the leaf and converting it into sugar. So the closer you get, the more penetration you get, but the top could get too intense which is what we saw in the peppers in there, the top. But it's a store, right? I mean, you just it gets away from you because you're busy selling stuff. I know, the shoemaker shoes, it's, every store is just like that. But it's still a really good looking garden that you have in there. It's probably one of the best ones that I've seen in Texas. Um, yes, um, so this is the idea. Uh, you're looking to absorb all the light with the grain of the leaf. <coughs> now, as this plant gets bigger, if it's twice the size, you wouldn't need the plant next to it. So the bigger the plant, the fewer required to absorb a thousand watt light or any watt.
for that matter. If this plant was literally five by five, two feet deep, you would only need one. If it was less than that, you would need more than that. So you, it doesn't, five by five, you can grow one big plant six feet around, don't care. You have to change the hood to grow a plant big instead of wide. But either way, all you have to do is absorb the green of the leaf. And, you know, that's the idea is you've got to convert all that light into sugar. Then you've got to figure out the gears because you're not going to be in sixth gear trying to grow that little plant. And if you try to grow a big plant like this with a compact fluorescent in first gear, you can't get there. So you don't start in third and you don't go from first to fifth, which is why buying one light in a rotation, like if you just buy 1,000 watt light, it's not quite the same now with digital dimmables because you can turn them down. But if you have a little plant like this and you've got a 1,000 watt light, you're going to be throwing 950 watts at the floor this week. And next week, you're going to throw 900 watts at the floor. And the week after that, you're going to throw 850 watts at the floor. It's a lot of electricity to spend in a veg. That's why I usually have people do a two light veg, because you can have a 400 watt veg and a 600 watt flower, a 600 watt veg and a 1000 watt flower. And if you grow a 600 watt veg and you put it in flower, the first week you're only throwing 400 watts at the floor. That's not bad. If you turn out, if you if it turns out to be a dimmable, you can throw your you can turn your thousand watt down to a 750, and now you have 750 watts over a 600 watt veg. Perfect. You're throwing 150 watts at the floor, um, but now the plants get all the light they want without too much light. So as the plants get bigger, ppm's and light increase until you get to the point where you're finishing. Then you decrease ppm's, but light doesn't change. This is the relationship that gets you start to finish. And in this equation, like I said, if we were in week five, you'd be at 500 ppm. Okay, so week five, right here, 500 ppm. Out here, 1,000. The last two weeks, 500 and then nothing if you're in media, or 500 if you're in hydro, and then you know even less so. The relationship between how much light and how much ppm is a scale-based, like shifting gears. You're not gonna be in the fast lane in second gear. That doesn't work. But it's awesome across the street, or if you're trying to pass up on an on-ramp, you're trying to get up to speed, second gear is perfect. But you don't start in third, and you don't go from first to fifth. And that's what causes too much light and too many nutrients. Because people take their 1,000 watt light that's meant to fill up this huge space, and they put it over their cutting. <laughs> and it can't go anywhere because it's too much light, right? Not only is their light so close, all of the nutrient companies would have you believe that you require a thousand ppm, I mean a thousand watts worth of ppm. All of the nutrient companies base their schedules on a thousand watt happy healthy harvest. If you have a 600 watt light, what are you supposed to do? Cut them in half, yeah. You cut the nutrients in half and if you have a 400 watt light, you cut them in by, by 60, 75 percent. Why? Because nutrients are merely the calorie that supports the amount of exercise or light that you do. Think of it like fuel in your car. The motor, that does the work. The fuel merely supports it. So the octane is the calories in fuel. Food is the calories for people. Nutrients are the, salt is the calories for plants. And light is the fuel. So light is exercise and nutrients are merely the calories that support it. And I tell you guys, there's a difference between nutrients, but there's only a difference at the, at the good end, when you're good and you're getting what you're supposed to time after time. Then you will notice a difference in nutrients. But if your plants look sick and shitty, if you, you know, I tell you guys that yield is based on how much light you have times how healthy your garden is times how full it is. Because if you've got a garden half full of sick, shitty plants, this isn't going to turn out like you think it is. This is about the health of the plant. The faster you can convert light into sugar, the greater the yield. The correct amount of nutrients is the correct amount of nutrients for that time and space. So in week five, you'd be at 500. At week 10, you'd be at 1,000. At week two, you would be at 200. If you're finishing, you'd be at less than the peak. It's coming off the peak. So how much gas you give it, how much nutrients you give it, is based on what you're trying to accomplish and how much light that you guys are trying, that you guys are throwing at it. You can throw a 1,000 watt light at a plant this big. You can feed it like it's a 1,000 watt plant but none of those things are gonna help. The correct amount of light and the correct amount of nutrients are what you're shooting for. And again, I haven't told you how to grow. All I do is tell you the statistical probability of how to avoid failure. Because the reality is if you don't fail, by definition, 
you've succeeded, or something close to it anyway. Um, the, the statistical probability is that when people come to the store, they're excited and they're going to do too much. The guy this morning, he read it on the internet. Guy comes in, spends $600 this morning, right? He was, I'd like to say he was here for the show, but he just happened to come in. And, and so he's sitting here and he buys the equipment, he's got everything, and he's going to go home and do it right now. So I said, dude, here's the grow book, and here's my no more grow more fact cards. They're $30 for the pair. You just spent $600. $30 is 5%. And more than increases your chance of success. If you don't do all the failures, you will succeed. The guy goes, no, no, I'm okay. And I was like, I had to sell it to him for 20 bucks for him to say yes. But here's a guy who spent $600, ready to go home and start right now. And I literally, here's the instruction book on how not to fail. No, I'm good. And so what do you suspect that that guy's gonna do? So most people that start this fail. If it wasn't, prices would go down, supply would increase, and the general supply and demand curve would such shift such that it's not worth doing. It's very difficult to get the correct amount of yield that you're supposed to get. And when you start to do the math of it, it gets even worse once you factor in the reality of the whole project. If you've got a thousand watt flower, you have a 600 watt veg. If you have 2,000 watts in flower, you have a 1,000 watt veg or you can't grow enough material to put into the garden and fully express the light. So let's talk about air conditioning. Generally, the small end air conditioners are 1,000 watts. They have that little $500 roller that we sell. Perfect, it's 1,100 watts and it will cool 2,000. Then they have the big one ton units that are 1,000 watts. They're literally 100 watts less than those shitty little roller ones. It will cool 6,000 watts and a CO2 burner, which is an enormous amount of heat. They're not on all the time, but it'll cool. The AC will be on all the time, but you can have a 1,000 watt AC that will cool 6,000 watts and a CO2 burner, or you can have a 1,000 watt AC that will struggle to do 2,000 watts, depending on your buy-in. Like anything else, if you buy the if you buy the commercial grade, it's more on the buy-in. They run about 2,500 instead of 500 but you get more than five times the amount of cooling. You go from two lights to six lights plus a burner and the same amount of electricity cools six lights and a burner that you were using to cool two lights, no burner. The thing is, once you turn on six lights, now you can add CO2 because you have an AC, you don't need to vent. If you add CO2 to six lights, you get 25% more yield. That means you have 7,500 watts in flower, effective watts, you only use 6,000 watts of electricity and only get 6,000 watts worth of heat. So CO2 continues to be more and more valuable as you go. I tell you guys, once you have six lights, there's no point in venting. You might as well turn on an air conditioner at that point and add CO2. Why wouldn't you? You're going to have to cool the garden no matter what. If, even if you vent, the glass in the hood is the second hottest thing in your garden. That's why your car is 140 when it's only 100 degrees outside, because the glass converts IR and UV waves into heat. Touch the glass the next time you're in your car on a hot day. It's the hottest fucking thing in your car besides the seat that's burning your ass that you're sitting in. That's because light is heat. All light. Even this LED. The difference is an LED directly converts electricity into light. There's no gas in a tube. All the lights that we see, like the HID lights and here in this display, they all take a gas in a tube, they heat the gas by sending an arc across it and it emits photons. The stuff in our ceiling like these fluorescents, they work differently. They take an electron in an orbital shell around the nucleus, they raise it to a higher shell, and then when the energy goes away, the electron falls back down and emits a photon. That's how these work and they're so cool. They don't produce nearly the amount of light per watt that an HID does or an LED. LED produces an enormous amount of light for way less heat. It's like a technological marvel, as long as you're using it in the right way. It also produces it in a very collimated form and doesn't spread it out. So, I mean, there are pluses and minuses, but that's light, more light, more heat, more garden. That's what we're shooting for. So the next thing is, if you've got a 2,000 watt flower and a 1,000 watt veg and a 1,000 watt AC, you're running 4,000 watts. You're running 4,000 watts, but you're only getting 2,000 watts worth of yield. So even if you get what you're supposed to, divided by four, you're getting half of what you're getting in flour spread over the total garden. Now suddenly we jump up to like say 6,000 watts 
and we still have a 1,000 watt AC, and we have a burner, a CO2 burner. Now essentially we have 7,500 watts worth of light, plus 3,000 in veg, and we're at 10,000 watts. Where the AC was one of, four, one of three, now we have one on 10 worth of light. And one on three is like 33%, one on 10 is 10%. So the fact of the AC suddenly shrinks an enormous amount. So the more lights you have, the more efficient it is to use an AC if you buy the right AC. So once you have rows and rows of lights, it's never about venting. You take out the glass, like rolling down the windows in your car. Now it's only going to be as hot as outside. Everything will get stolen, but forget that fact. You roll down the windows, I got a Jeep. It's got a front windshield, no doors, no nothing. It never gets hotter than outside. It's got a top, so the seat doesn't get the sun, so the Jeep's never hotter than outside, but you get in your car and sure as shit, it's going to be like 40 degrees hotter on a hot day. That glass in your hood does the exact same thing as a window in your car. The more lights you have, the more glass you have. Let's, let's talk about venting. <clears throat> if the air is so cool that you can suck cool air through the hood, because that's what we're talking about, not just removing the heat. You can remove the heat, but the glass is still producing heat in the garden. So if you've got all that glass and you take it out, suddenly the garden isn't nearly as hot. You can continue to vent the light, but now you can't use CO2 if you vent too much. There are some things where I tell you guys, if you've got like four lights, you can get a box, run a little bit of ducting to each hood, put a small fan like a four inch on it, turn it down with a speed controller to a three inch fan, and just suck a little bit of air out of each hood and take out the glass. There's no point in you sucking in the far end of a hood if you can just take out the glass, not have all that extra heat production and suck in. You can still use CO2 in a situation where you vent very little air as opposed to a sealed room. But I'll tell you a story, we had four lights, you run, we had a little thermal laser LED temperature gauge and my hoods were 151 degrees with a thousand watt light. It's about five square feet of radiant sheet metal. We had a duct and just the little fans, um, not, the, not the big fan, we just had like a little six inch version. This one's the Hurricane from Sunlight Supply. I had the six inch version of this pulling out of a thousand watt light with just a few feet of ducting from a tent. My, my ducting was 99 degrees and the hood was literally like 151 degrees. I bought an insulator and covered the hood and I came back in an hour lifted the insulator and my hood was a hundred and two degrees. The hood metal, five square feet of radiant sheet metal came down 49 degrees, 33% less temperature in the hood, radiant sheet metal. All that heat went into the ducting and my ducting was now 114 degrees, 15 degrees hotter than it was before. So I know where all the heat's going, into the ducting and out of the tent. Covering the hood, taking out the glass and venting a small amount of air is the most effective, coolest way to create a garden. The wings like this are less, not this bulb, don't count this bulb, it's just a fun bulb. The wings like this produce less heat than a wing like this. Why? Because aluminum foil and aluminum take the light and convert it into heat. In fact, this is a, this is a glass tube. If glass is the second hottest thing in your garden, that thing's going to get really hot. But the trade-off is glass tubes are phenomenal for venting. You just bump them up against each other. You don't even need any ducting. And then suddenly you can run 40 of them in a row and they're awesome. Or you could just buy that thing and get you know, buy a, a hood and get an air conditioner because if you don't have cold enough air outside, there's no point in sucking it into the room. Because if you're trying to cool 140 degree light with 100 degree air, congratulations. You can get it down to 100 and some degrees, but you're not going to get 70 out of it. So you still have to cool the air. Once you understand that you have to cool the air, there is no reason for you not to buy an air conditioner. There is no reason for you to vent. And now you add CO2, so you get more from the same electricity. That's what this is about. You're trying to get the most yield you can, because that's the definition of a grower, a true grower. You maximize yield for any garden situation. Those are the conditions. You get the maximum yield possible in any garden situation. That's a grower. I can grow in any of the chemicals, any of the systems, anything in the store. Because I can grow. 
Otherwise, there really is a difference between systems, media like soil, cocoa, and grodan. Those are all the easiest way to grow. Hydro is faster, so it's a little more complicated if you have a problem. It happens faster. An arrow gives you the best, most significant results, but it has very few sick days. And if you have a problem in aeroponics, you might as well throw everything away and start over because it's unrecoverable. Things happen so fast. So really what we're talking about is how much light and when. What's your expected yield? So do you have a favorite question that you ask customers when they come in the store? I mean, it's a loaded question, I do. But do you have a favorite question? Uh, what is it? I mean, like, it, it all depends on you know, how many plants, right? That how many plants? That changes everything, how many plants, what type of area they're working with. Right? Those are the two things. It's, you can tune everything around that. That's funny. That's I have one. I have a different question, but it's all about tuning everything around that. I ask them how much light they have in flower. Because if you have a thousand watts in flower, I know everything I need to know about what your garden is supposed to look like. You got a thousand watts in flower. I automatically know you should have 600 watts in veg. I also automatically know that you should be getting 24 flowers every 60 days. I also know that you should have a five by five space, two feet deep, or a plant this big around, or four plants like look like this, or 20 plants that look like this, or if you're in a GH Aeroflow, 60 plants that look like this with a big hood. So the next question I ask somebody, oh, 1,000 watt, you must have a 600 watt in veg. And they go, no, I got a 300 watt, four foot, six bulb T5. I go, oh, then you're only getting, you know, 16 flowers per thousand. So you're getting 16 flowers per thousand. Yeah, about that. I go, oh, okay. Would you like 24 flowers per thousand? Would you like to get the correct amount? Because a 1,000 watt light's worth 24 flowers. And they go, oh, I've been doing this for years. No, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I go, dude, you're missing 50% of your yield every harvest. What I don't want you to do is think about that in the store. Tonight when you go home and things are quiet and you're about ready for bed and the guy at the store told you you're missing 50% of what you're supposed to get times how many years have you been doing this? I want you to think about it in the quiet of the night because if I'm right suddenly you've got a third less of you're supposed to times five years six crops a year times five thirty crops times one third. Ooh, that is a whole lot of profit you're missing. And it looks like you're profitable because you're doing okay and the value is good. But the reality is you're still missing a third of what you're supposed to get because you did not veg enough plants to fully convert the light into flour. And with a simple fix like, tell you what, why don't you bring me in that 300 watt T5. I'll sell you a 600 watt and give you a little bit of credit. Now I got one use thing. I got some money out of the guy and he's got the right thing. Now the person that's doing that usually does one of two things. They'll go home. And they'll, they'll always tell me in the store, no, nah, man, whatever. <laughs> whatever, dumbass, I've been doing this for years. They'll come back, depending on their age, if they're over 45, they'll be back in three days. If they're 19 to 45, they'll be back in two months. Because they will have gone to every other store, because they don't want to hear what I have to hear. So they'll go to every other store to try to figure out why their shit isn't what it's supposed to be, and it's still too small, and they're still not getting the yield, because the only thing they'll believe from me is I'm supposed to be getting this yield. They won't believe anything else. Or they're hoping about two months, you've forgotten that you already told them what to do, and they didn't listen to you. Right, and that's exactly what happens. They'll go to every other store, and in two months, they come back, and they all say the same thing. Man, it's just like you said. I'm still not getting what I'm supposed to, and she's smaller than she was six weeks ago. What are you talking about now? And I know they went to every now other I'm store. Listening. Yeah, now I'm listening. So. You know, the other half is they always tell me, I'm testing some shit for a manufacturer. Bullshit. You're not finishing, you're not getting what you're supposed to. No manufacturer wants you to rep their product, you're failing. That's not how this works. If they wanted to rep you, you'd be repping them. But that guy always tells me, no man, I'm doing this product, no I'm doing this product, no I'm doing this product, I switch to this product. The reality is they never finish because there's so many problems. What I really try to get you guys to do is smooth it out so you get what you're supposed to. So if the guys come back in two or three days, Usually they're ready to listen. You also want to do some swapping because now that they're ready to listen, they have some money. So that's how I hook them. Like if I know they're not going to buy anything, I tease them. Oh man, you should be getting like 30% more. And then they think about it and think about it and think about it and think about it and eventually they come back. Always. It always works like that. But you got to gamble and let the customer <laughs> walk out your door. But I do this so often, I know how it turns out, right? So usually like 85% of the time they come back and they buy the shit. But they come back and they're ready to listen now. So if everything's going well, I know that if your yield is three quarters of what it's supposed to be, if you're at about 18, per 18 flowers per thousand watt, I know that everything is going the way it's supposed to. 
You didn't have any problems. What you don't have is enough plant material to convert all the light. So if you're getting pretty close, and especially if you're getting pretty close consistently, now we just talk about modifying a few things. Plant shape, because the last thing you want to do is have one branch that's taller than everything else than the canopy, because you have to put the light above that. So you cut that out, and that's a big step, because now the light, all right. So there's a couple of things usually if the guys are finishing, but they're not getting what they're supposed to. Usually it's add a plant or two, veg two weeks longer, shape up the plant better. It's the guys that are getting half of what they're supposed to, but they're still finishing. Those guys usually have a problem at some point like not enough mag, overwatering, too many nutrients, but not way too many nutrients, so it just kind of builds up as you go. So if you're getting like about half of what you're supposed to, really I've got to go through all the questions and fine tune it. You ask plant count. I don't ask plant count because light's based on yield. You get a thousand watt light, you have 24 flowers. Don't care how many plants, one big one, four that take, it's about a canopy, 50 cubic feet oh, so per when thousand you're watt flowers, light. You're talking about ounces. What? Parts of the plant. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> a 400 watt light, you get eight. Flowers. Okay. Now you, yeah, now 16 flowers from a thousand, yeah. 24 flowers from, 16 flowers from a 600 watt, 24 flowers. So we're talking about a pound and a half of produce right. from a thousand watt light, a pound of produce from a 600 watt light, a half pound of produce from a 400 watt light. Thousand watts, three times the brightness. You should expect three times the yield. You need three times the canopy. You can't grow an apple without growing a tree, and you can't grow. 24 ounces of produce in your pocket. Right. It requires a certain amount of space to convert that light. <coughs> Corn fields, acres and acres, thousands, tens of hundreds of thousands of acres. Every fucking plant is the same height. They all do the same thing at the same time. So sometimes what I do is I run into people that have three quarters of what they're supposed to get. They're at like 18, 20 ounces of produce. And it turns out that they have five different kinds of plants under their flower light. Okay, that would explain it of a kind, of a size, under a light. If you've got one plant that's here and the rest are here, your light has to go above the highest point in your garden. So everything else suffers for this one plant. All right, maybe you want that one plant, whatever. But not every plant grows in every shape equally well. So shape is a lot of it. So we talk about shaping plants. Anyway, so yield, how much light you have, times how full your garden is, times how healthy they are. So really still talking about converting light into sugar. It's literally like a three-hour bullshit school about how to turn light into sugar effectively. Um, and because what people think it is is not what, what it actually is, right? Because everybody talks about, oh, their light's 18 inches off the plant. Oh, you look at the guys who have that three-by-three three box that's lined with aluminum foil, and it's got like 17 CFLs screwed into it all the way around. This hobby isn't for everybody. And I'll be the first to tell you, this may not be for you. Now you got, let's say you've got 200 watts in CFL light. If you've got a four week veg and an eight week flower on a 10 week cycle, 200 watts divided by 10 is 20 watts a week. You've got 20 watts worth of light a week. But you would also be at 20 PPM then, wouldn't you? Look at this. You see this? You see this? All right, good girl. That's what it takes to give 20 PPM. Uh, you got 200 in your tap water. I have 550 in Vegas. It's a different yeah, experience. Yeah. But to get to, to feed this plant, you know, what are we talking about here? Nobody feeds these fucking house plants. Nobody. You know, look what it's growing under, that much light. You know, there's nothing that you have to do to that plant. And if it does need nutrients, she'll tell you, and then you'll feed her. Okay, so you only feed them when they ask for it. You only water them when they ask for it. You're not looking to be in there with like four ounces a day. You'll rot the root hairs. There's no roots. So shaping of plants. Shaping plants is super important. If you get a runaway top, the light has to be placed above that runaway top or that'll burn. We saw that happen here in this, in this display. <coughs> so there's topping, there's lollipopping, and there's super cropping. Oh, yeah. Hey, they don't need any help from you, I mean. We always see your dog toy. We never see the dog. Oh, there's a different, that's a different dog. Um, there's a camera here because we're doing a grow school. If you're not in, you know, I mean, like, you don't, you don't have to, park, you can just go around. So if you don't want to be on it, if you have some questions, 
<laughs> I do have a question about venting. Yes. I had at first I had the tube lights and they were I had uh, they were all connected and I just left one end open so I was sucking air from the room from the room out and then out right and then I felt like well then that means I'm sucking hot air cool. into the room by from whatever cracks whatever cracks the, the ambient air outside can break. yes and so then I started I, I changed it and I hooked the the open end to the floor, cut a hole in it, and then I was sucking air from the outside, pumping it to the outside. Okay, so you're always limited by ambient, right. outside right. ambient. So if your outside ambient is that cool, great, open up the windows. Like, you know, San Diego grows. <coughs> if you just open up a window on both ends and let the cool ocean air blow through. <laughs> right? Like I'm in Vegas, it's just... Well, yeah, this was here, so... Yeah, so it doesn't work. But if, you, if you're venting through... So it's not cool enough. Well, I don't know because you have to tell me how the garden feels. Also, you're bringing in humid air. So if you've got a bunch of lights together and you're venting here, but you're <coughs> sucking in here, you would put the CO2 and air conditioner here so it moves across your whole garden. Mm -hmm. What I challenge you on is the math. Now, you, however, were sucking from a different room, room A. You were venting room B and blowing it into room C. So you didn't really suck any air out of this room. If you don't suck any air out of the room, how are you cooling it? Okay. If you had just taken out the glass and quit venting, you would have had the same result. And now you can add CO2. Because the glass is the second hottest thing in the room. So if you took all the glass out, or instead of running them in a chain, you ran them parallel, one to each, and you took very little air out, just enough to remove the heat, that would have been the same thing. Now, if outside is so cool, that you want outside air in your room, perfect, then don't worry about the cracks, don't run the other end out of the room. Yeah. So you can try to pull hot air out and replace it with hot air. Or you could take out the glass, quit venting, add CO2, and now cool the room. If the air is so cool outside, you still wouldn't vent the lights. Just suck the air out of the room and bring fresh air in, but you don't get CO2. Um, there are some places that are that cool, but most places aren't. So you're always going to add AC. Yeah, I never, I never was able to use, I, I never used a CO2. How many lights did you have? Yeah, I had four 1,000 watts. So your 4,000 lights would have been 25% more. You would have been at 5,000 watts worth of yield for the same electricity. Wait, wait, don't think about that here during the show, tonight, when it's quiet. Think about 25% more times how long yeah, you were doing eight it. Eight years. Eight years times six harvests a year. So if you're at 48 <laughs> harvests times 1,000 watts. Yeah. That's one and a half pounds of produce per 1,000 watt light times 48. So you're at 68, 24, 72 pounds of produce you missed. And that's what I mean by a lot of people finish, but you don't get what you're supposed to. I was also worried about hot spots, so that's why I uh, exhausted it underneath the building, because the building is outside of my backyard. Like well, you would have avoided a hot spot by raising the lights or lowering the plants. Oh, I mean, I mean a light, uh, hot spot from above, because at the time, uh, they were flying helicopters oh, over and looking for hot, for hot spots. So I mylarded the whole room. Yeah. Mylar is not an IR block. Oh, okay. The stuff that's an IR block, the infrared block, you have to have infrared block to the do stuff it. Stuff you put in your attic for. for uh, that's a that's a thermal insulation. It's still not. It still doesn't fight FLIR, which is the forward-looking infrared uh -huh. radar. Infrared is infrared. Okay, so what does help that? The IR block. Um, oh, hang on okay. a sec. Uh, let me grab something. I'll show you exactly what it is. This stuff's three ply. The number one mid-crop plant killer is a duct failure when you buy cheap duct food. So Thermofill provides the stores with these swatches. Oh, okay, so that's like that stuff over there, I guess, huh? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's not the same thing that's inside of a tent, but they have a couple of different things. They've got Mylar, IR block. So this is this is, you can see it's triangle, it's like neural, mm -hmm. and it scatters the waves so uh, it doesn't work. So it can't penetrate. Diffuser. So this is thermal flow ducting. Grab a side of it, grab a couple things like this, both hands, glasses, there you go, and pull. There's a difference wow. between this stuff 
and the and the tubing and the ducting that you buy for a dryer vent ducting. Right. right. So this stuff here is black on the inside, so it absorbs light and doesn't reflect it. Silver on the outside, and then in there you can see it's threaded with a wire ring mesh. So halfway through flower, when your cheap shit bursts from pressure and temperature, and you come home and find your garden dead, it doesn't happen with thermofoil. Right. If you made it halfway through flower. Like you made it past the first three weeks where if you didn't have enough roots, the plant dies. Uh -huh. And then you made it to weeks four, five, or six, and you come in and you tell me everything's dead, I will tell you it's because your duct blew out. Because if you made it to week four or five of flower, you're good. Yeah. I know you know what you're doing.